You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. One week after the BNR, the Pioneer meta is wide open for brewing. We take a look at six of the spiciest lists from the first week of play. After that, we plug in the reality chip and upload the latest tech with new deck lists in Modern and Pioneer. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, coming to you live from the Twin Cities, and I am joined, as always, by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Schriever, Cave Dan Online. What is going on? Doing well, David. I'm here. I'm ready to rebuild Pioneer from the ruins of the, the BNR last week. Yeah, it was kind of a surprised uh, BNR announcement came out of nowhere, and uh, especially with a lot of people having only recently joined the format, they were sort of left to pick up the pieces. So good news on that front is the deck dump. Pioneer deck dumps for Magic Online come out Mondays and Thursdays. The Monday deck dump had 54 deck lists, David. 54. Yeah, there were weeks when it was 19, so just to give people perspective of how low the format was at a certain point. There were weeks when it was like 12. <laughs> it was 14. I was talking to Emmy last week, and we were talking about like whether a Treasure Cruise and Dig would ever get banned, and he was like, well, you know, someday it'll happen. I said, well, it's been years, and it hasn't happened yet, and he could not believe that Pioneer was like multiple years old. <laughs> Seems like only yesterday. It's bizarre. It's like a new lease on life for this format. The last deck dump that had this many decks was in January of 2020, which I believe was like when the port format was almost brand new. Yeah, it was probably a couple months old at that point, I think. Well, we will get into that. We have a bunch of sweet technology we want to highlight. We have some general thoughts on the format. First, we need to do a little housekeeping. Just a reminder, if you're enjoying the podcast and you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. You can join for as little as a dollar a show, and that helps to support us, continue to do all of the quote-unquote good work we do here, brewing and whatnot. You also get Discord access. There's a bunch of people on there firing some wild brews around, helping break down your brews, coming up with cool car ideas. And there's other fun perks uh, if you're in the market to start uh, showing off some swag as we play in paper tournaments all through the summer here. You can get uh, play mats, you can get sleeves, etc. So, Absolutely, yeah. Patreon support means a lot to us. Allows us to keep doing what we do. As David said, I will not say, <laughs> I will not promise any quality, but it allows us to keep making the show and everything that you contribute gets put back into the show that we're putting out here. So if you like what we do here at Faith is Brewing, we would love to have your support. We would love to see you in the Discord. Yeah, so one of the things you also get to do is vote on the new monthly project. The current monthly project is Jenny Faye. That will not be discussed in this podcast, but if you listen to the Monday podcast, Dan has a couple of wild brews using that card in Modern. Uh, one of the leagues is not yet done, but we are 3-0, right? So we're, we're in a, a place to make some noise. So tune in on Monday to hear uh, about that deck and maybe check the 5-0 list, you know? Oh, yeah. Hashtag spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to put this on YouTube so you can see it crash and burn in real time there. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's talk Pioneer. We're picking up the pieces after they burned it all down. Winota was banned. Expressive Iteration was banned. David, you did not record with us last week, but you shared some of your initial reactions. How are you feeling now, now that we've seen a little bit of how the things might shake out? Well, I think they're, we're still waiting, as we will be forever, uh, for all these mid-range lists that Winota was holding back. Um, 
I, I don't think that uh, that's really what happened, but I, I do think that something probably had to go from the blue-red list. The sort of nut draw from that deck was just kind of unbeatable. So just taking some one of their first two or three turns and making it a little worse is worth doing. Uh, you know, Winota was really good, especially against creature decks that did not want to play a lot of instant speed interaction. And so we're going to highlight some of those decks that are allowed to, uh, that have been allowed to flourish in the post Winota world. So there's two big tournaments every weekend on Magic Online. I think of these as the most competitive pioneer events you can find. That includes like paper pioneer events. I just think the online crowd is like very, <laughs> very cutthroat. You're going to go up against like hardcore grinders, people who just play Magic Online for a living even because of how the global economy works. So I always look there first to get like a sense of like how healthy is the top tier meta when people are actually trying to win. And just by chance, this weekend was actually a showcase challenge, which is only once a month. It's like even more competitive than the regular challenge. So we got to see a lot of people, top tier Magic Online players, taking their crack at what they think is the best deck in the new Shape of Pioneer. And their answer was Mono Green by a huge margin. Mono Green Devotion was the most played deck, the winningest deck, and the top 32 on both Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, and unfortunately that has prompted people to just piss and moan. It's been embarrassing watching people call for bans after more cards got banned, which does teach wizards that you should just never ban anything because people are never happy. Um, it was overwhelmingly streamers that were complaining about the cards that just got banned. It's overwhelmingly streamers that are complaining or that are requesting new bans. I think we just need to ignore them. I don't think these people have the health of the format. Uh, in their hearts. The results of one challenge should not be uh, leading anybody to ban anything. I mean, I assume that goes without saying, but of course I have to say it because that's not how people are operating. So what should I do with all the whispers of like people grousing, grousing about Nykthos? Just ignore them? Just ignore them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can reban Oath of Nyssa. We've, uh, <laughs> we've banned, <laughs> unbanned, reban. I mean... <laughs> Every six months, it, it, it switches legality. It's like a, it phases in <laughs> to the format and then phases out. It's like it's like having a vasectomy and they keep like reversing it and then right. doing it, <laughs> reversing it again. Mono green is eminently beatable. People just choose to. I, I said this would happen in my preview notes. People are like, "Oh, I don't have to play as much removal anymore," and they're like, "Oh man, turn one elf. That sucks." <laughs> I cut all this sweet one mana removal I was playing. It's it's almost as if I still need it. <laughs> So somewhat surprisingly, the next most successful deck by the numbers was Rakdos Midrange, and this was again true on both Saturday and Sunday. I don't quite understand why. I mean, I thought you laid out a good case for how Rakdos tends to prey on creature decks, and Winota was the premier creature deck. So with Winota gone, maybe there wouldn't be as much for Rakdos to do. But it does just play good cards, and in an unknown meta, maybe that's the correct approach. Well, and, and just playing a pile of removal, many of which can destroy Planeswalkers, is actually good against green, right? You you push their elf on one, you thought seize them on two, take their four drop, you can dread bore to uh, stop resolve Planeswalkers, and because green does not interact with you, you know, a resolve Kalidus that gets a couple tokens, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you, you can end up just dominating the board. They can't stop uh, Chandra if you've got any control of the board. So I think the fact that mono green did well is a reason that black and red did well because in throughout magic in any format, you know, these rock, you know, rare and and mythic rare decks that just play all good cards up and down the curve do very well against uh, you know, mana elf decks that are really hoping to like, you know, one three skip and and they're they have a bunch of awkward spots if you disrupt them. So maybe the Rakdos players were just like thinking one step ahead. They knew that Mono Green was going to be popular. I don't think anyone played with any strategy at all. I think red black players really love to play Jundless. They're they're really good at them, and uh, you know it gives you uh, the illusion of control, right? That's why you know Reed Duke or whatever is still playing Jund, <laughs> Boomer Jund in the year twenty twenty two. And yeah, you do get to play a lot of the best cards like Push and Thoughtseize are you know among the whatever you can rank them however you want, but they're in your they have to be in your top ten best modern cards. And, you know, Fable's got to be near the top 10 if it's not in the top 10. And that's that's a good chunk. I mean, that's 
you only get to play 36, you know, non-land cards in your deck, and a third of them are, you know, in the top 10 in the format. That's pretty good. Last comment I'll make about the top tier meta is that Is It Phoenix did win one of the two events. How are they going to replace Expressive Iteration? I think, David, you called it exactly, right? These spell-based Xerox lists, they're not going away. They will just have to adapt. One player was able to adapt and win the whole tournament by playing Strategic Planning instead of Expressive Iteration. A much worse card, but it gets the job done. Yeah, I think the main list that got hurt by Expressive Iteration getting banned are the Blue-Red Control lists. So they actually had specific cards they were trying to find, right? They're trying to assemble Narset plus the uh, various other ways to flip the opponent's hand. In the absence of that, these other cards, strategic planning, etc., they're more or less as good as expressive iteration in specifically Phoenix, dumping cards in the graveyard. And people just weren't playing as many cards that could do that because they didn't think the deck was going to be as good, right? So any other thoughts on the current metagame? I think it's still taking a while to shake out. Um, I, I don't know that we've solved it, right? I don't think we need to ban anything. I think mono green is very beatable. Obviously, red black can be beaten by almost any deck. Um, yeah, I hope people continue to explore. Calling for bans right now is is actually very toxic to the format. So if you if you're doing that, then you should just not play Pioneer. Like if, if you don't like Magic, that's fine. Just just don't play Magic though. Don't don't get involved with the rest of us. Eighty <laughs> percent of content creators slink away with their tails between their <laughs> legs <laughs> when you're done playing magic you turn to magic content and... but the thing is about magic streamers is the game was never meant to just be played 10 hours a day in some sort of novel sense right it's like it's like eating ice cream right for every meal like ice cream is awesome when you have it every once in a while <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, along those lines, what I'd like to do now, since we are a brewing podcast, is instead of thinking about the top tier of Pioneer, let's celebrate a little bit. We got 54 decks in a deck dump. People are excited, people are optimistic, space has perhaps opened up, we're not sure. But people are trying things, and just looking through the lists that were published over the weekend, I mean, there were some absolute bangers in there, some spicy ones. So. David and I have just picked out a few that we'd like to highlight to show people what's possible in the current Pioneer. Yeah, so the first one is a super cool Niv Mizzet Reborn list. Now, we know Niv Mizzet Reborn is a Pioneer playable card. It's been actually better in Pioneer than in Modern, the, uh, the format where Dan uh, created it out of whole cloth. This list, though, is different than all the normal lists. They are playing... I, you call it like Fetchland Niv Mizzet, right, Dan? So it, yeah. it has a bunch of cards that you might not recognize them, but Broker's Hideout, Cabaretti Courtyard, 4X Evolving Wilds, and 4X Fable Passage. Now, just a reminder to everybody, Broker's Hideout is a land, and, and same with Cabaretti Courtyard. When they enter the battlefield, you sacrifice it, and when you do, you search your library for a basic forest, plains, or island, put that under the battlefield tap, then shuffle, and you gain a life. So it's like an Evolving Wilds that has to be used immediately and can only fetch um, one of three specific land types. Obviously, the Cabaretti fetches the Naya mana base, and you do gain a life as an extra bonus for, for the lack of flexibility uh, compared to Evolving Wilds. Now, why play all these lands? That's very strange. Well, for the reason that they have four Renegade Rallier and four Omnath. So their ability to go like turbo with their mana is incredibly high. They're playing two Valky. Most of these lists only play one. So you can still bring Delight for Valky. They're still playing the four Bring Delight package. But you can also just hard cast Valky relatively easily because Renegade Rallyer is basically a three mana permanent ramp. And Omnath, the turn it comes into play, is very likely to be followed by um, a fetch land. So you, you, know, you can get to nine mana, or excuse me, the seven mana to cast Tybalt uh, relatively consistently. So it's a really interesting variation. The Niv Mizzets are not as good, right? You only have four Bring Delight. Four Supreme Verdict, three Deafening Clarion, uh, and four Renegade Rallyer to hit. But um, your Valky plan is much better, supported by five uh, unconditional main deck sweepers, and then another three Deafening Clarion. So this is a deck that is built to crush aggro. Four Omnath, uh, eight sweeper. This list is shocking to me. It's just absolutely shocking. The pilot is four and Magra. They had a 5-0 and a top 32. 
So they're they're doing work on this list. For Megra is an old school new music player from back in the day when we were first working on the deck in modern. And they've always approached it from like a really fresh angle. Well, the fresh angle here is Pioneer is not a fetch land format. I mean, how many times we've we been told this? That's the only cards banned right off the bat were the fetch lands. They said we don't want any fetches in Pioneer. Except Fatal Passage. And if you want these crappy limited only fetch lands, you can have as many of those as you want. And Fora Megra is saying, well, what if? What if I had 16 of those in my deck? Suddenly Omnath becomes amazing. This is a card that you identified a few weeks back, David. You said, you know, there's no Omnath deck in Pioneer. Right? You could brew something sweet with that. And here we see it. For Renegade Rallyer, a card that, you know, I kind of forgot about. And certainly we thought we would never see in Pioneer outside of like Enigmatic Incarnation specifically. How do you fit all these lands into the deck? Well, they're playing 30 lands out of 60 cards. And I wonder like how that's actually possible. Like how do you not just flood out? And I suspect that part of the answer is the card Courier's Briefcase, which kind of stands out as like a weird card here. One in a green. It's a treasure that's also an artifact. It brings a human with it that's just gonna chump block in this list and you can stack it for any color to help you cast your Omnaths or to help you cast Renegade Rallyer when you're playing a tap land on turn three. But then you can also pay five. You can play Wooburg, tap, sacrifice the Courier's Briefcase, and draw three cards. And with four Renegade Rallyers in the deck, I think you'll have the ability to keep getting back briefcases the later the game goes, and then you can just reload your hand if you need to. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So they're not playing cards that you're thinking, okay, you're going to play 30 lands. Of course, you're going to play Growth Spiral. No Growth Spiral here. You're playing Nimizit. The best card in traditional Nimizit is Sylvan Carry Added. It is the card that allows the deck to function. As anyone knows, it, uh, playing Nimizit, if they're on the play with Sylvan Carry Added, it's very difficult to beat. If they're on the draw without Sylvan Carry Added, almost any deck can get underneath or go over the top of them, right? So, but but uh, this this person has identified, like, I don't need to do that because the Renegade Rallyer is not just a ramp package. It also turns into this card advantage engine, exactly like you're describing, Dan. Now, I don't know if I believe in, in Pros Prosperous Innkeeper that much. I might still want to play a couple of carry adds over that. I know the treasure allows you to, you know, trigger uh, your Rallyers, etc. But um, the, the addition of Courier's Briefcase with the Renegade Rallyer with the Fetchland package is something totally unique. I've never seen anything like it in the format. I don't know if it's the best way to build this deck. I do think that this entire build is super anti-aggro. Um, and I'm surprised that that was their diagnosis is like, I want to have, bring a really anti-aggro deck to what I thought was going to be, you know, a Lotus uh, and a blue-white type of uh, a format. But maybe they correctly identified that the other decks that are going to be good are going to chase those, those lists out. Yeah, this list is built to do like just a couple things and do them well. So it sweep the board really well. Four Verdict, three Clarion. So yeah, they're not going to play Carrier. One Cleansing playing. Nova. When's the last time you saw a Cleansing Nova on a list? <laughs> oh gosh, wow. Okay, so eight Sweepers plus Bring to Lights. So that probably informs their decision to not bother with Carrier. Then the sideboard is like four, 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 three. Four Damping Sphere, four Dovin's Veto, four Leyline of the Void, three Archon of Ameria. So they're just like, I don't want to lose the Lotus. I want to have something against Control. I want to have something against the graveyard decks. Now, does that just, does that mean is it? I'm not totally sure why the Leylands are there. Is it in Grease Fang, I suppose. If you're confident enough that your Omnath, Nivs, and Bring to Lights can win the card advantage game eventually, then yeah, mulliganing to a Leyline, even against is it, makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's one of those classic, like, I'm going to play this main deck. I think this gives me a huge amount of game against whatever, X percent of the field, 60%, 70%. And then the decks that I have a very bad matchup, because their game one match against control and combo has to basically be like 20% or 30%. I'm just going to board in like eight cards and be actually great against them in the boarded games. And, uh, you know, obviously it's super successful. So, I, I, yeah, it's just, you can tell that a lot of thought's been put into this. Um, they've rethought how to do all this stuff and, and they've, had a lot of success. All right, the next deck up is one that you flagged, David. I saw Ledger Shredder and Arclight Phoenix, and I thought, well, what's the big deal? Like, yeah, okay, so it's a new Is It Phoenix list. But then I looked a little more closely, and I saw all these black mana symbols. It's actually a blue-black list 
where Arclight Phoenix is the only red card, and that extends even to the mana base. There's no red lands at all, except for four of the red-black pathway. So this list is just Demir, Demir Phoenix, if we can call it that, where they're planning to get the Phoenix in the graveyard, bring it back by casting three spells, but they, they are not bothering with fiery impulses. I guess without expressive iteration, there's not a huge incentive to play red. Yeah, this is something I had kind of like edged up to, but never kind of like made the connection that this person did. But I was thinking like, man, you could really play like less and less red. Like I don't like any of the red cards. I don't think the red removal is as good as push, even without fetch lands. I think push is a little better than any of the shock variants right now. Um, and they just went all the way, man, like pure gonzo journalism. They're playing two Kaito, four Tainted Indulgence, plus the four Shredder, and I guess Thought Erasure and Consider are also ways to put Arclight into your graveyard. Um, so I think their sideboard's way better. Red basically does not have any good sideboard cards. The only useful red sideboard cards were actually really good against Winota, so you lost the, the appeal of red in, in sideboard games. Black gives you way better matchup against Control, uh, and I think it gives you a better matchup against um, aggro. And yeah, I just I just love this the idea of this deck. I think there's no reason to actually play red at all. And uh, other than the occasional time when Arclight Phoenix gets stuck in your hand, I think this is just the, the better version. And again, this is the second deck in a row that like attacks the sacred cows, the things that we quote unquote all know to be true. It says like, well, what this book presupposes is, what if it isn't? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when you're playing red, you have like Lightning Axe as another way to get the Phoenix out of your hand. But there's plenty of effects in black that do that. We just don't think of them as like discard outlets. But there's two collective brutalities. You can Thought Seize yourself if you really have to. Um, the Tainted Indulgence is actually good. The Ledger Shredder is actually good. Kato can loot. So I think there's plenty of ways to discard Phoenix. That being said, Outside of like the is it core, you're just not going to see as many cards. You're not going to be playing pieces of the puzzle to make sure that every single game you're just like always have a full hand. Here you have opt, consider, treasure cruise, but there's not as much card draw. There's just the tainted indulgence beyond that. Yeah, I mean, I also love that Kaito lets you win fair games. Like Kaito is just a very powerful planeswalker. And against control, if they have to tap out to resolve your Phoenix and, you know, whatever, they attack your graveyard. Like, you just resolve Kaito and start plussing it. Um, it's just really hard for Control to, to beat you. Yeah, they've got the third Kaito in the board. They got all the go blanks. Yeah, I mean, the black cyborg cards are extremely attractive. I think I could see how this could shore up a lot of previously problematic matchups. So kudos to the player Vera Quios on the 5-0. Yeah, super cool list. What's next? All right. Up next is a list. I don't know if this was inspired by the list that we were playing, but it's pretty close to the list that I proposed. Um, so I just like that, whatever. Convergent Evolution, I'm in for that too. So this is a list that is called Esper Humans. They're playing Archfiend's Vessel, Blood Soaked Champion on one. Their two drops are Luminarch Aspirant, Rafine's Informant. Um, they have the fourth Thalia package. They're playing four Extraction Specialist, four Rafine Scheming Seer. They even uh, supplemented their mana with a Agadim's Awakening. There's a few little tweaks to, to what they were playing. I was playing four Push in my uh, Esper Hate Bears list. They're playing four Reflector Mage as their interaction. Um, and they have a few other cards added that I, I, like I didn't play Tenacious Underdog. They're playing two of them. They're playing one of Adeline. Uh, and they're playing one less land, which is a little alarming to me. Uh, only 21 mana sources with all these three drops is a little dicey. I had actually recently added four um, Thalia's Lieutenant to my list hmm. and four one with it, and it felt awesome. I just missed a 5 0, otherwise, I was going to send you a screenshot. So, this is a decision this player, uh, Elidio the Bravo 157 SL. <laughs> uh, they also are playing four Lieutenant. Lieutenant like supercharges the deck. It, it is a ton of power. When you bring it back with Extraction Mage, Extraction Mage turns into a 4 3 uh, lifelink that they just have to kill. And if they do, then you just have lieutenant in play that just you know keeps getting counters um yeah i just i just love i you know i just felt like i keep missing on the five o's with the the list i've been playing i think it's super sweet uh rafine is just one of the more fun cards that we've brewed around in a while and uh i've i was like oh man it'd be so nice to get a five oh they're just sort of like inspire other people because people just won't play lists sometimes if it doesn't five oh so i'm glad that elidio the bravo uh <laughs> was able to uh to do so just hopefully it gets people playing this type of list exploring with these types of cards 
I don't necessarily like the choices they made over the choices I made, uh, but you can't argue with the results, right? So. Surprised that they went down to two Luminarch Aspirant. They're trying to make room for the Thalia's Lieutenant. Yeah, the, car the card's been insane for me. If, you if you're telling me Hopeful Initiate is better than Luminarch Aspirant, you're just not going to ever convince me. They snuck in one Charming Prince that has like a neat combo with the Extraction Specialist, but I don't know. I kind of want I kind of want the remaining Luminarch Aspirants. Yeah, I, I you know... A one of Tenacious Underdog wouldn't be the end of the world either. Uh, I don't think that's terrible, but yeah, like I said, I don't actually agree with a lot of the choices that they made, but uh, the shell is really strong. I, that's the point I want to emphasize. Like, you just have these openings that can't be beat, and when you force the quote-unquote best decks in the format that they can't just do, they can't, if Blue-Red draws their nut draw and you draw your nut draw, they actually can't beat your nut draw unless they stop doing what they're doing and actually interact with you. And that's always what I wanted is like, I don't have to do anything special. They have to stop doing their best one, two, three, four drop to actually stop what I'm doing or they can't win. And this deck presents that to blue red. They, they, they cannot beat you. Uh, and it's, t it's tough for mono green. I'm three Oh six Oh against mono green with, uh, with my list. Now that has been helped by getting to play push. I don't know if you're losing a lot of points by playing reflector mage. You're going to struggle with turn one mana elf, especially on the draw. Um, but maybe Ref Reflector Mage is better in other matchups, so. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go back to push and try your list again. I mean, you convinced me, after your many great results, that this is, like, onto something. Rafine seems to be such a powerful card. So if you need more convincing, check out this 5-0 list from Elidio the Bravo, and, yeah, uh, keep putting Rafine into your decks. All right, what is up next, Daniel? Yeah, on, along those lines, I mean, the other card that we were testing recently was Extraction Specialist. We got, like, so-so results with it, but one of the avenues that we thought maybe we should explore next was looking at Pyre of Heroes, something that is done successfully now in Modern. Um, Modern has, like, a Humans deck that plays Pyre of Heroes with some Extraction Specialists. Why not do that in Pioneer? I mean, you're not going to have ether vial to like free up your mana completely but i mean pyre is still like doing all the things maybe the format is slow enough that you can get off the ground so build yourself a humans pyre deck and see where that takes you the player alabaster wolfie took it upon themselves to do exactly that and they arrived at a deck that is mostly mono white but they're playing green for four Collected Company, and three Werewolf Pack Leader, splashing a double green card. To do that, they're relying on Secluded Courtyard, on Claimed Territory, Mana Confluence. I mean, they're, they're going well out of their way to play these Werewolf Pack Leaders. Yes, they are. They're deep in the tank. To be fair, though, if you're going to play a bunch of humans, Unclaimed Territory and Secluded Courtyard are free, right? It's the, it's the Mana Confluences that are really uh, making you pay the iron price for your uh, three of, not even a four of, Werewolf Pack Leader. That's true, and if you're playing the Unclaimed Territories, adding another color, like in this case Reflector Mage, which they have four of, is also relatively free. So you have plenty of pathways. You're going to play white most of the time, but I mean, at a certain point, you can either get a green pathway or a blue pathway, and, and you'll be set. The creature selection for a humans deck uh, is pretty normal. I mean, there's four Thalia's Lieutenants, four Luminarch Aspirants, I think that's correct. Three Three of Inspector, three Dauntless Bodyguard, three Charming Prince for that combo with Extraction Specialist. Um, Extraction Specialist, bring back the Prince, blink the Specialist, bring back something else, and you freed up the Prince to do whatever else. So with Pyre of Heroes, you can actually make that sequence happen whenever you want, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, similarly, you, you want to have some bullets for the Pyre to get. There's two Brutal Cathars and one Blade Historian, that's the only four drop. Blade Historian gives all of your attacking creatures double strike. Yeah, it's a super cool list. So normally when we see humans, we see a few more Lord effects, right? We see Adeline, we see some of the three mana Lords, but they have identified that if they're going to go up to three mana, it's either for Specialist, which is hopefully adding a ton of power to the board and recovering, you know, post Wrath, or like you say, you have value Pyre Lines. Or you're basically topping out with these Tempo Positive Removal, Brutal Cathar, Reflector Mage, and you're continuing to get in with your Luminarch Aspirant, all these Lieutenant, Werewolf Pack Leader, etc. Um, and then I love Blade Historian. I've never thought of it as an awesome hit at the top of this. 
But they've said, like, we we don't really want to play a mid-range game, right? We're just trying to Coco on EOT, get in with a bunch of damage, and Blade Historian does not have haste, but it functionally has, like, a come-into-play ability, which is that if creatures that are about to attack that turn now all of a sudden all have double strike. Um, and you can probably steal a lot of games, right? Turning your, your Reflector Mage, their creature, put it back in their hand, they can't play it the next turn, they have to do something else, then you turn your Reflector Mage into Blade Historian and your Werewolf Pack Leader, Lieutenant, Aspirin, etc. And I'll start attacking for, you know, six instead of three. Can I play Thalia in the main deck with Collected Company Empire? Or maybe you can, but it's a bit risky. So instead, they put all four Thalias in the sideboard, along with some specialists like uh, a couple elite spellbinders and a third extraction specialist for, you know, more card advantage. It's an interesting build. It seems like their, like, plan A just isn't that good. You know, like, it feels like they're not actually forcing you to respond a lot, but but maybe it's better than I think. I have been super impressed. My one drop into Aspirant is actually just so good. Like, Dauntless Bodyguard into Aspirant, uh, you get functionally get to attack with a Wild Nakadal, recently banned in Modern, and then the next turn you're attacking with <laughs> at least 5 power is just crazy good, right? So, uh, and getting back Aspirant with Extraction Specialist has, has felt amazing when they're sort of forced to kill it proactively. Um, you know, it's it's just great. And it happens all the time. I'm sure you notice this too, Dan. You're about to go to combat, right? So they kill Aspirant. They don't kill it to start a combat that you already get the trigger. So that means uh, priority comes back to you. So you can Extraction Specialist on your first main still get back Aspirant and still get your trigger. Okay. It's happened multiple times. Like, I'm about to do it. They stomp it or whatever. Like, all right, I get my sweet two for one with my... How can I lose? I'm playing Bone Crusher Giant against all these cheap... Humans and I like extraction specialist aspirant back. Aspirant puts a plus one plus one counter on whatever one drop I've been play. I attack them for four. They've already taken seven damage uh, from you know my one drop. It, it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is Bant humans with pyre of heroes and collected company. Now for something completely different. Yeah, I was gonna say finally I I, I can't decide which of these decks is the wildest, but this is among them. So we were skeptical of some of these hideaway cards. On Monday, we're going to talk about fight rigging, a card that we've started to, you know, be a little bit more inspired by. This is widespread thieving, the red hideaway card. So just as a reminder to people, two in a red, hideaway five. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, you create a treasure token. Then you may pay Wooburg. And if you do, you may play the exile card without paying its mana cost. One of the things that I liked about this is actually getting a treasure for a multicolored spell is very powerful. So I like that. I thought the passive ability was among the better ones of the five. What I didn't like is I'm not really getting a spell for free. I'm having to pay Wooburg. So I have to really be getting a powerful spell, right? If I quote unquote cheat and admit it in play, it's like, no, I just paid five. <laughs> I could have done that with just instead of playing wise for thieving in my deck, I could have just drawn them to visit and paid the five, you know, that way. So I was a little dissuaded from playing this card um, because I just didn't think the, the, the mana payoff was enough and I don't think the treasures were quite useful enough. Well, this player has understood that maybe you just need to play a bunch of super powerful cards. So they have two Ugin, two Emrakul, two uh, uh, Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. They've also adopted this Renegade Rallier, Broker's Hideout, Cabaretti Courtyard, Four Evolving Wild, Four Fable Passage. So this is another deck that's that's taking advantage of this really cool interaction that I guess I, I'll just say myself, I won't speak for anyone else, was not aware of. They're playing a few more conventional cards, Grow Spiral being one of them. Um, they're still playing the Bring to Light package. But they're on four Omnath, again, because they have all of these fetch lands. So they can naturally just cast, right? I mean, getting up to eight mana is not a hard task if you have uh, Omnath in play. Hell, uh, casting Ulamog isn't that hard if you've got a bunch of, of fetch lands lying around. So. I really think this build is very, very cool. Yeah, it's right in that sweet spot of cheating something into play with widespread thieving and just ramping to it with Omnath Locus Creation. Because exactly like you said, David, widespread thieving does not really cheat things into play. It actually just sort of ramps, right? Almost like the making treasures ability, the static attacks on widespread thieving is the main payoff. And then every once in a while, you can occasionally pay five or something if you want to. Now this player, Tara, Magic Online player Tara has gone the extra mile and put in stuff where you're really getting a great deal if you're only paying five for your Ulamog and your Ugans. 
but it's a it's a shocking list to me. And you just have these natural curves. So let's just imagine we go turn three widespread thieving and we miss. We don't hit anything good. Whatever we put a growth spiral under there. Turn four omnath. We get a treasure. Turn five fabled passage. We actually have ten mana. We just cast Ulamog. So we're talking about something that ramps way better than the red green ramp list that won the uh, challenge the other day naturally right that 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 opening if they don't kill Ulo, if they don't kill omnath right away just beats every every deck in the format without counter spells so that that's just really interesting to me they are actually playing growth spiral again i think that card is actually very good if you're going to do the widespread thieving thing because you're just adding lands to the board and you're creating all these extra treasures i mean the treasures you know we're always trying to do something clever with them can we play the dragon that lets us tap them for mana it's like what if we just sack them <laughs> and cast Escape to the Wilds and Ulamog the uh, Ceaseless Hunger? It's like, yeah, that's that seems pretty good. <laughs> Hear me out. What if we just use the treasures? <laughs> but yeah, and then another super clever use of Renegade Rattler. Obviously, you have all of the fetch lands again, but Renegade Rattler is multicolor, so better than Extraction Specialist again because it triggers widespread thieving. Um, so yeah. Very, very cool. I wonder if the thieving is just rarely using its uh, ability, and it's it's just the the treasures that are allowing you to cast you know an early Emrakul and early you can just hard cast Tybalt. Yeah, that's fascinating to me. Because you really need to have a lot of mana if you think like you're casting a multicolored spell before you can use that trigger, right? It, it, it can't be used on a blank board, so you have to like cast Is It Charm and then have five mana left after that. That's just a lot. <laughs> All right, last deck I want to mention is from the player Aryan, who's one of the top Magic Online grinders. Working on this vampire question, and I've mentioned this a few times now, that I feel like the traditional vampires deck is stuck in a rut with like Champion of Dusk, Dusk Legion Zealot, etc., etc. Why not play Blood Tithe Harvester? Couldn't she build a better deck with Sauron that way? Well, Aryan said, okay, yes, I'll put Blood Tithe Harvester into my deck. But what other vampires do they want? Well, they're still playing Gifted Aetherborn. They're playing three copies of Evelyn the Covetous. You might expect to see three Champion of Dust. They're playing three Evelyn straight up, saying maybe Evelyn is just better. Evelyn is 2-5 Flash. Whenever Evelyn or another vampire enters the battlefield under your control, exile the top card of each player's library. So it's kind of like that Tybalt effect. Um, once per turn, you may cast one of those cards spending any color to do so. So Evelyn is like super powerful as a draw engine. I'm, I'm intrigued by that. But Aryan didn't stop there. Not only are they playing Blood Tithe Harvester and Evelyn, they're also playing four copies of Corpse Appraiser. Another new card. Blue, black, red, 3-3 three, three Vampire Rogue. When Corpse Appraiser enters the battlefield, exile up to one target creature card from any graveyard. If you do, you get to look at your top three cards, put one into your hand, the rest in your graveyard. That is a ransack the lab strategic planning effect. The rest of the deck is cards you might expect. Removal, Planeswalkers, Sorens, etc. Yeah, I mean, so they're going full on Grixis here to play Kaito and the Corpse Appraiser. You're asking a lot of your mana just for those cards, I guess for Mystical Dispute in the sideboard. I have had Corpse Appraiser played against me multiple times with no creatures in my graveyard, and man, does that look terrible. <laughs> um, I do like the Evelyn. I think that is sweet tech. Uh, I don't know that I need to play the Kaito and the Corpse Appraiser. Um, I think I could go <laughs> anyway on that. I do want to note that Soren the Mirthless minuses to make a vampire token. That is an actual vampire. Mm. So there's even more hidden vampires than you might realize uh, with the uh, Evelyn. Okay. Yeah, there were like three different Corpse Appraiser deck lists in the 5-0 dumps. People are experimenting with this card. I don't know what the conclusion is. I have not had a cast against me. And again, you know, what we see a lot is, I think uh, LSV, obviously very popular streamer, Hall of Fame player, and their team at the last, not really a pro tour, they played a Grixis vampire list that played for Corpse Appraiser. And that was one of the techie cards they had because uh tenacious underdog is one of the most played cards in in um standard mm -hmm. so against cards like that corpse appraiser is great right even the quote-unquote control deck is that uh esper midrange they're gonna have creatures corpse appraiser always gets them there's just so many decks in this format that don't have creatures um that, that i'd be a little nervous about it right they're, they're playing 
eight removal spells and four corpse appraiser. So if you're not playing creatures, you're going to have a very good time against them. And if you're playing lots of creatures, you are going to probably have a bad time against them. All right. So that's just a quick check-in on the state of Pioneer, both the top of the meta and some of the brews coming out of the woodwork. I'm excited. I mean, this seems sweet. These deck lists seem awesome. I don't know if they're any good, but I'm excited to try them. Yeah, I, especially Soren decks. I just think like Soren is the best three mana planeswalker, and Kaitel's the second best three mana planeswalker. And they just had the best idea. Like, why not just play both of them? Like, <laughs> that seems awesome. <laughs> and when Corpse Appraiser is good, when it actually is triggering, then that's really good, right? Like a three mana three three that impulses when it comes into play is is a broken card. Yeah. Sets up your next Corpse Appraiser. <laughs> exactly. Or a removal, right? To turn on the Corpse Appraiser that's already in your hand. All right, so before we go, I want to take a quick moment to check in on the card that did not win the vote last time. The card that actually came in second place, which is the Reality Chip. Now, David, when we were going over the nominees, you said, okay, you felt like there was more space to explore, that people had not quite solved this card yet. And I do think that is true, and I'm wondering if you could like elaborate a little bit on what you might have in mind for Reality Chip, for, for the Reality Chip fans out there. So I think the main thing that people understood is that a reality chip has seen by far the most play in hammer time. Uh, you know, just as a one of the splash is basically free when Luris was legal, it's Luris legal. Right. And in the grindy post board games, when they could stop your kind of nut draws reality chip is a card that would just lead to all kinds of advantages. The other place it saw immediate play is in combo decks, right? So, we fraternize with a, a lot of fellows in with Grinding Station. I mean, I'm talking about Jiggy Wiggy. Immediately incorporated it. It's exactly the kind of card that his deck was looking for. And we've seen that deck have success, right? But what we haven't really seen is it just played fair, right? We, we see it in decks with like Song of Creation. We see it in decks with um, Jeskai Ascendancy. It's in all these combo decks, and often what is it doing? It's it's a random artifact to turn on the Lady of the Lake, Emery. It's uh, another card that turns on um, your Mox, right? That needs a legend, and it often isn't like attached to anything. It isn't doing it isn't doing the thing that we want it to do, which is <laughs> we want to play our five mana sor or five mana enchantment from Boomer Magic history, uh, and we want to play it in installments so we can get it out way earlier in the game. And no, one's, no one is playing it fair, basically, right? Everybody is using it in one or the other of these ways. And I think, like, Sylvan Carry Added is just a playable card in Pioneer, right? I, I jokingly call it the best card. At various points in the format's history, it has been the best card. Uh, I don't think that's the case right now, but it is certainly playable. It's a fine card. Some of these geniuses out here are tacking out Niv, so they don't even need to play Sylvan Carry Added. For those of us with a smoother brain, we still have to play it. Um, <laughs> and so... The, the shell of Sylvan Carry Added, Reality Chip, Tezzeret Tireless Tracker. I don't know the rest of the cards that are going to be in that list, but there is something there. Because you just have all these draws that are nice. Um, you can go Sylvan Carry Added into turn three Tezzeret. That's fine. You can go turn two Carry Added into turn three Tracker plus land. That's nice. You can crew up Carry Added with Reality Chip. You can play Tezzeret and equip chip for just a blue right so you're getting your five mana effect functionally for way less uh, carry added is the best card to accrue with chip and it even gives you the extra mana to get chip onto it and to use it once it's played so you were nice enough to uh indulge me you know in my uh, eccentricities here um you played a bant list that i proposed it had a bunch of kind of wild cards in it you did three two with it even though you weren't that impressed with the list you said we need to do some work. And so that's what I want to work on is that kind of shell, uh, but really built around those cards that I've just outlined where you're playing a fairish plan, but your long term game is just like, you think Evelyn is generating value. Uh, a carry added equipped with chip just can't be beaten almost by black decks. Uh, you're, you're just going to inevitably like just draw your deck. I'm staring at these four tireless trackers here and thinking about all of the evolving wilds and <laughs> broker's hideouts we were just talking about and all those other lists like is this what we're supposed to be doing in pioneer maybe maybe 
So it's a deck that is like a little bit light on action, right? There's a four Tyler's trackers and you use planeswalkers to get the rest of your big punch, right? Three Tesseras, two Wandering Emperors, one Karn. Reality chip, like you really need it because sometimes you know, they could just kill the tracker. When I played this league like a few months back, I got paired against like red black almost every round. The fact that Chip can attach to your Sylvan Karyate and just like get you out of any hole is super attractive to me. Yeah, so the the notes that you had were you didn't like I was playing the uh the two mana automaton. You said, all right, we don't have enough artifacts, I didn't like that, so we got rid of it. Um you, you didn't like we didn't have enough land, so I added two glass pool mimics. Obviously, tracker's an awesome card to copy, but if you just need to, you know, a lot of times if you're like turn two carry added, turn three tracker, you want a land drop. You can't use that one mana anyway, so playing Glass Pool Mimic tap there is actually fine. Mm. Um, so we went up land drops. You wanted more removal, so I added two Wandering Emperor, one Sky Sovereign uh, Console Flagship. Um, I even added two Thraben Inspector. The Thraben Inspector Gilded Goose interaction with Moonlink Moon Link Prototype is actually very good. Uh, and Inspector is even better than normal because we have clone effects if we really have to clone something. Also, just anything that puts clues into play is good for Karn, Sign of Urza, and is good for Tezzeret. Yeah, I'm willing to give this the deck another chance. Um, I mean, it was sweet, and maybe with the new Shape of Pioneer, there's something more to explore. I was thinking about what you said about how people have not really done anything with the reality chip. So I went looking to see, like, is that actually true? What can I find? I checked all the published results since Neon Dynasty in both Modern and Pioneer. And I was surprised. I mean, you were you were right. Like in modern, I would expect to see a lot more chip because of Stoneforge Mystic. You can always play one, and you'll find it in Hammer. You'll find it in some versions of like Thopter Sword, but there's a as a one of. It's not really a main part of the plan. Um, Grinding Breach. I think Jiggy Wiggy tested this right out right away and concluded it ultimately wasn't right, even though he loved the interaction of Dragon's Race Channeler and Reality Chip. Just the fact that even without equipping the chip. Just knowing what your top card is allows you to make so much better plays with the Dragon's Race Channeler Surveil Trigger uh, when you already know if you need to Surveil or not. So I feel like there's something there, but the only like brew that really stood out to me in Modern is a list that I'm going to call Jeskai Stoneblade. It's actually like red-white with Fervent Champions, and it just splashes blue for four Express Reiteration and one Reality Chip. This is from a player, Young Dingo, from like March of this year. Fervent Champion, you know, a card that you would sometimes see with like swords, Sword of Fire and Ice. We played it with Sunforger a while back, um, got a 5 0 with it. It reduces the equip cost by three, so it actually allows you to equip a reality chip. Actually, no, that doesn't allow you to equip a reality chip. Is that true? Because it's reconfigure. Hmm, maybe they didn't know that when they built this deck. <laughs> Yeah, we actually talked about this when the card was spoiled. The specific verbiage is very important. Um, so yeah, it does not work with Fervent Champion. That's heartbreaking. Oh, that's so heartbreaking. Which is why I didn't ever propose that in, in Pioneer. That would have been the first thing I would have done. <laughs> okay, so Reconfigure is not the same as Equip for these purposes. That's too bad. Okay, in Pioneer, I mean, you talked about the Song of Creation deck, the... Simic Paradox Engine combo deck. We've highlighted these in recent weeks. Jeskai Ascendancy. I saw Mr. Rabe 5 0 with that just yesterday. Although he wasn't playing Chip, as far as I know. Yeah, I saw his list. So he, he referenced a, a Timu list that did play a one of uh, Chip, and uh, he did choose, chose not to play it. So, so that's my point is like, yeah, it can show up in a 5 0 list, but like. Mr. Ray or Timo, whether you include one or not, I mean, th this is not a chip list, right? You're not, <laughs> you're not crewing up chip to something and starting to fly through the top of your deck. That's what, when you first see this card, that's what you're imagining is. Mm -hmm. There's this old school effect for people who aren't our age, right? It's two blue, blue, or no, excuse me, one blue, blue, blue. Or is it one and four blue? What, Future Sight? Future Sight. Two blue, blue, blue. Okay, <laughs> so this is this was a card you could do in standard that there was a there was a multiple control decks that played this card. It was so sweet. This is your chance to do it and maybe do it for less than five mana and certainly do it for less than three blue mana. Um, and that's not really what anyone's doing. I mean, 
that was like your fail state if you you know already had uh you know your enchantment in play for hammer but other than that this is basically just like a random artifact that turns on you know mox amber <laughs> yeah the last list that caught my eye that i thought for sure was going to be a tesseract list is from new player one two three this is a 5-0 from may 16th we're in pioneer here again it's blue red artifacts of a color affinity but there's no affinity cards there's just metallic rebuke because we're in pioneer but instead of playing tezzeret they're playing four copies of the antiquities war saga that its first two chapters let you look at your top five cards and pluck an artifact out of those to put in your hand and then on chapter three all of your artifacts become five five until the end of the turn they attack and potentially deal lethal damage why choose antiquities war instead of a card like tezzeret because tezzeret I mean, it works with so many of the other cards here. It works with the Reality Chip. There's two of those in the main deck. There's four Experimental Synthesizer. Tezzeret allows you to activate that for just one red. What do you think, David? Am I, like, expecting too much from the Planeswalker? No, I agree with you. I, this is the kind of deck that I would really, really, really be wanting, uh, Tezzeret. A turn three Tez is just so good, like... Especially in a deck like this, where cards are really polarized in their value, like Springleaf Drum is great on turn one, but for the rest of the game, you kind of don't want it, right, on turn three. And so Tezzer is just awesome, right? Draw two, discard one is the best effect uh, that you can plus a four-mana Planeswalker for in the format. Like Soren sees play because you can plus draw a card and take some damage. Uh, Tezzeret's plus is so much better than that. And you're, you've already kind of paid the iron price. You're playing a bunch of artifacts, uh, many of which are not that good. At the same time, Antiquities War is way harder to interact with and almost does have a fail case that your opponent cannot beat, right? It draws two artifacts by mm. itself, artifacts you can immediately play, and then if they don't stop it, it just kills them. I mean, because you're, you're going to attack for like 30 or 40, you know, whatever. Definitely the way that this deck is built. This deck is playing four Springleaf Drum, four Moonstar Prototype, and when you have those, you have to play Ornithopters. So there's four Ornithopters three Mox Ambers, four Experimental Synthesizers. That's like 20 cards in your deck that are just zero or one mana artifacts that barely generate a resource. So you have to like convert that into something. And maybe Antiquities War is more reliable at converting that into something that wins the game. Yeah, because I think even with the extra draw from, from Tez, you, there's just so much air in this deck. Also worth noting, you have Psy, Master Thopterist, and Sahili, Sublime Artificer. Mm -hmm. So those are another cards that are just crapping out like these terrible 1-1 one -one tokens that don't really win the game but they do win the game if they all become 5-5s five -fives for a turn so is the reality chip just here to turn on the mox ambers or is it also like a second future sight card for when everything goes wrong there's a lot of air in the deck yeah i mean i'm sure it has some uses and it does force them to spend re removal again we're, we're imagining a world where they don't have push right if they have push they just kill your reality chip but against red removal they're forced to now kill every Ornithopter or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think that Chip gets crude a lot here. You're playing three Mox Amber. It's just another way to turn it on. It's another, uh, you know, in addition to Emery. So yeah, it's like the, 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 the state that we all imagine is I have a future site going in a relatively early state of the game, and then I'm just flying through my deck and just playing fair after that. Like, that's what I want to do. I love playing like fair interactive magic. I think people have maybe correctly identified that does not lead to a lot of wins in Pioneer or Modern. <laughs> uh, or at least it doesn't if you're playing a two-mana 4 <laughs> first <laughs> before you get to do that. And so they've said, look, I'm not trying to play fair magic. I'm trying to resolve Antiquities War, and if I do that early enough, then I'm just going to kill you. Like, I'm literally just four-mana sorcery, suspend two. <laughs> I'm going to attack you with, you know, 25 fives. Like, what can you do about it? And these other combo decks are saying the same thing, like, yeah, if it all goes wrong, sure, I'll crew chip up to something. But what I'm really trying to do is, you know, Mox Amber is the broken card, right? Emery is a card that can be broken. Jeskai Ascendancy is a card that can be broken. I'm trying to play cards that activate those broken cards. And if this is, you know, has a fail case where it can do a little bit more than nothing, that's fine. But I'm, I'm also playing much worse cards, right? You're playing four Ornithopter, so like a two mana 04 isn't that much worse than that. Yeah. All right, so that's a quick look at Reality Chip. Are there any stones unturned for this card? Like, if if you had to, like, come up with another home for it, or have we basically, like, seen whether it's to see Mox Amber, Combo Engines, and maybe a fair deck with Tezzeret? 
I mean, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what else you could do with it, though. Like, the problem is it's so tempo negative to try to crew up a creature. So, and of course, it can die itself. So, you want to play it in a deck in a format where the removal isn't super efficient. So, that really makes me skeptical already in modern because there's basically free removal or a tons of one man removal that kills it uh, or the creature is crewing. You want a hexproof to be a relevant ability. Could you play it like. I, I realize this is crazy even as I say it, but like. Could you play it in a Bogles list? Hmm. Like in the post board games, you know, they take out their removal, you crew up your Bogle, and then, you know, whatever they're, they're counterspelling or doing whatever they try to do to interact with Bogles. But in theory, you just kind of fly through your deck playing all these cheap one mana enchantments on your Bogle. Well, there's a green white hexproof list in Pioneer that does play like, I think they do play SRAM, right? So that draws yeah, a card yep. off Reality Champ. <laughs> But they're also playing Season of Growth, which is maybe just yeah. like a better version of what you're describing. And again, the, to the splash blue, right, is trivial and modern, but adding a third color is really punishing yourself. Like, as, a, as I was saying in the Vampire list, you really have to be sure you want that third color. Because um, it's doing probably, on average, like two or three more damage to you a turn and is often delaying you a full turn and casting some spells. It's a very major cost, so... That's why I was thinking Bogles in like modern, the blue splash sometimes existed anyway, but Bogles isn't really a deck we see anymore. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. The fact that it's an equipment, you expect it to be an equipment package in Pioneer, but there really isn't. And in modern, it's specifically Pure Steel Paladin circumvents that, uh, that problem we were just talking about with Fervent Champion. Pure Steel Paladin does allow you to free equip, so you actually do see the reality chip routinely attached to things in like the hammer deck in modern. Um, whereas Pioneer lacks a card like that. Yeah, so the, the card that works is the four mana uh, red white planeswalker that makes a one one and attaches an equipment to it. Oh, Nahiri, heir to the ancients. Yep, so it works with Nahiri, and of course, it still works with the enchantment that attaches a creature to an equipment when equipment comes into play, which is played in hammer time and modern and i actually lost to a hammer time deck <laughs> in pioneer recently with my esper rafine list i just didn't draw enough removal um <laughs> they weren't they weren't splashing blue but they did you know they played the one mana enchantment they just played a two drop double striker and then they just played <laughs> hammer they just had it all it was, like, it was just dead on turn three i i oh boy <laughs> i had a thalian play it was crazy like i played turn two thalia and died on turn three i just i'm not sure what i was supposed to do <laughs> All right, so maybe there's maybe there's more to this. But again, like all those cards that support that in Pioneer are red-white. So you're having to splash an entire color for a card that isn't really yeah. part of your primary game plan, right? You're you're trying to crew up a, a creature with 10 extra power. You're trying to get them dead. This card is saying, like, let's play this long interactive game. And, you know, <laughs> in addition to being off your game plan, I'm also going to make your mana worse. So it, it asks a lot of tough questions of, of you. All right, so that's Reality Chip, the runner-up card for this month. Time permitting, maybe we'll take this tireless tracker, Tezzeret Brew, through a spin with these improvements. But from now on, we're on to the winning card, which is Ginny Fey. Uh, I've been testing this card in a couple different lists, which we will talk about on Monday. Absolutely. Until then, I bid you adieu. Decklists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in on Monday for a look at fight rigging, plus testing results with Ginny Fay. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. If you like what we do, you can join our community at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.